Okay, let's go ahead and set up the circuit for the I squared C using the ADXL 345. We'll use the application circuit that is specified in the data sheet in the section for the I squared C. This is on page 18. And you'll notice that the chip select, the CS, is tied to the high line. We have the SDA and the SCL both pulled up high, and I'm using 10K resistors. The alt address, that's the SDO, which is right here, and that will be tied also to high. It shows it's tied to low here, but we can see that in the description, it says that with the alt address pin tied high, the address for the device is 1D. So we wanna use the 1D since we, this is the only one, the only device on the circuit. So it doesn't really matter which one we use, but I'm gonna tie this one to high anyway. And then we'll be connecting the VDD and the ground to the high and low rails, to the power rails. The microcontroller shows a couple places where you can connect the I squared C and we're gonna be using the number one, the I squared C1, and the SCL and the SDA. The SCL, I'm going to be using the one on, on port B, pin six for the SCL, port B, pin seven for the SDA. You can see that port B, eight and nine are also available for the SCL and SDA. So if you're using the port B, six and seven for let's say the USART, TX and USART RX, then you can use these instead. You'll also notice I have two other wires plugged in to the circuit, and this is actually the logic analyzer. I have them plugged in. It's the brown wire and the black wire, and they're going to monitor these two lines to ensure that I have the correct communication going on. The two wires that I'm using on the logic analyzer is the channel number one and channel number two, and I also have the, the ground, which is this first wire here, connected to the ground rail. The form factor of this board, well, it's going to cause it to cover a lot of the pins, a lot of the tie strips. Fortunately, the back of the board has no contacts, so we can put components underneath. So when we plug the board in, components can reside under the board. The pins that I need to reach are going to be these two pins here, 59 and 58. 60 is the boot pin, and it is connected to ground at this location. And that's pretty convenient because the board has ground on the right hand side and it can be plugged right into the, the boot pin on this side of it, not on the other side of the resistor, on this side of the resistor because it's a direct connection to ground. And we have SDA and SCL right here. So they're gonna have to tie to these two pins from this location back to somewhere around here. So there'll have to be a couple wires that stretch along that location. So let's go ahead and build the circuit. Let's start by adding the two wires to connect the SDA and SCL from the board to the microcontroller. We need to pull up the SDA and the SCL lines with resistors, and I'm using 10K resistors. To power the board, I will add a wire from the VCC pin to the power rail. To maintain the current ID for the device, I will connect the SDO pin to the positive, and the CS chip select pin needs to go to positive as well. Now we can seat the board in the proper tie strips. If you have a logic analyzer, you can do this, but it's not required. I'm simply taking a pin from a header. I slide the plastic portion down, and I'm going to insert it into the female end of the connector for the logic analyzer. I do that for all three connections that I'm using for the SDA, SCL, and the ground. You're not gonna really need a logic analyzer, but if you start to see problems in communications and you just can't pinpoint why these communication problems are happening, then logic analyzers are a really good investment to save a lot of time and understand what's going on in those lines. I will leave in the description some links to the logic analyzers that I recommend and to the logic analyzer that I'm using on the NewbieHack website. For the I2 series, I set up a new project called I2 C Tutorial, or I2C Tutorial. And we can see that we have our standard skeleton code here. I'm gonna first add the include for the chip. To access the port B pin six and seven, the SDA and SCL pins, port B needs to be enabled. And next we need to set up the mode, type, speed, and the alternate functions. We'll do the mode first, which tells the microcontroller that we're going to be using an alternate function for those pins. For the mode register, 
to set it for alternate function mode, we need a 1 and a 0 in these two bits. Let's see, 6 and 7. So it should be a 1, a 0, and a 1, and a 0. We'll do pin 6 first. So I'm going to put the 0 in, in the 0 bit of pin 6. And we want this 1 to have a 0 in it. This is a 0, zero bit for pin 6. And for the 1 digit, we would like a 1. So we're putting a 0 in the 0 bit, and we're putting a 1 in the 1 bit. So let's do that for pin number 7 as well. So now we've set up the mode for alternate function. Now let's take a look at the type register. And because this is I squared C, and I squared C uses an output open drain state, where we use the external resistors, the 10K resistors that I, I put on the circuit, we use those to pull up those lines. We'll set both of these to one. And for the speed, we're going to go ahead and set it as the lowest speed. And we're going to set as zero at this position and this position. It doesn't really matter what, if there's a one or a zero in this position here. So as long as you put a zero in here, the speed is going to be set to the lowest. So now we've set zero at those positions. And since we are working open drain, and we're putting the resistors on there ourselves. We're gonna do no pull up, no pull down. So we'll set these to zero. And we'll go ahead and use this one here, which actually is stored 11 or one one. So it becomes a zero zero when you do an and and a not. You can see that it has C here. Let's see what this looks like in binary. You can see that it puts two ones there, so when you do the and and not, these two will be zero. Now I'm gonna open the data sheet to see where the alternate function lies within those pins. The pinout and pin descriptions should have the information we're looking for. So you're gonna look for something that says alternate functions, and it should look like this page here. So let's go to the port B, and we're looking for pin six and seven. It looks like we have the SCL and SDA on the AF1 selection of these pins. So we just have to remember AF1 and let's go back to the other um, data sheet or the reference manual. And you're gonna look for the uh, GPIO alternate functions low register because we're looking at pin six and pin seven nothing above that. So we want to select the AF1 and we want to put 0001 into these locations and these locations because it's AF1. And by doing this, we're telling those pins to use the alternate function one, which are the SCL and SDA functions. There's a few ways you can do this. I think I explained this somewhat in depth in another video, but you can just write out the whole binary number, this entire binary number. And I'm going to show you that method, but you can also use the left shift operator as well. And we can see that it has an array of two positions, which is zero and one. And we're going to be using the low or zero. And we're going to just have it equal to the binary number. And I'm going to write it out as if it's shown in the diagram. And we can see that there's those four sets on each on each row, so there's eight total. And we want a one to be here and a one to be here. And this should be the correct number. These positions, let's look at these positions here. This is 24 and this is 28. So we could have done this using the left shift operator. And we're oring these two, so ones would be put in those positions, left shifting at 24 spaces and left shifting at 28 spaces. Now we can start adding the I squared C code for controlling those registers. In the advanced peripheral bus, we want to enable the I squared C. You can see in the RCC, reset clock and control register, the advanced peripheral bus 
has the I squared C one and two enable bits within this register. So let's go ahead and invoke that. Now we're at the stage where we need to look at the timings. Setting up the timings is rather complicated. We have a lot going on here and there's quite a bit of math that you have to, to do to set the timings correctly. And in the data sheet, it gives you timings information, which we will use. So first we can tell that we need to set this up as a 400 kilohertz SCL clock frequency, and that is a maximum. So we can go lower than this. And instead of going through all of that math, I noticed that they specified an Excel file called AN4235. That will determine the timings. This is the timing register. It'll it will determine the timing number that you need according to certain specifications you enter into the Excel spreadsheet. So let me show you how to find this file so we can use it to determine the timing value that we have to put in the register. So I'm simply typing in that number and the STM32 and we should get something from st.com. Let's see if this is the correct one. It says it was for the, uh, I don't know, for the three and for the zero. So this is the one we have. So it'll work for the one we have and getting the software should give us the Excel file. And once you log in or register, you should start getting the download. So let's take a look and see what's inside this folder. And you can see it says I squared C timings configuration. I'm gonna to need to enable editing and enable content. Okay, so we're gonna be using our microcontroller in master mode and we'll use the standard mode, not the fast mode or the fast mode plus. We'll keep this at 100. You know what, let's, let's go ahead and change it to 400. Okay, we want to put this in fast mode. So let's change that to 400. All right, let's try to go ahead and run it and see what happens. You can see that it changed the SCL high and the SCL low. The SCL H high is two and the SCL low is 10. It also changed the SCL DEL part of the timing register to one. It also shows that we're at a zero for coefficient of di uh, digital filter, you have the analog filter delay on, and we have a rise time and a fall time. I'm not gonna mess with the analog filter delay and the coefficient of digital filter. I'm gonna keep that at the reset value, but I may uh, change these numbers because the ADXL may require these numbers to be changed. So let's take a look at the ADXL. So let's, let's look at the rise time in nanoseconds first, see if we can find that. This is the rise time here, and that says maximum of 300. So this number is fine. It falls within that the realm of what this allows, a maximum of 300. It can't be more than 300. So let's take a look at the other one, which is the fall time. So let's see what the data sheet says for that. So it gives me two different options for fall time. They both have a TF here and they're both T11. And over here, it shows it shows it right here for the, at the fall of the, the SCL and the rise and fall of the SDA. And it says that it needs to be a maximum of 300 or a maximum of 250. So I'm just gonna make sure that it's below those maximums. So those should be fine. So I'll go ahead and use this number for the timings register. I'm gonna copy that. So we'll put that number into this register here, timing, timing register. In the example code that it uses for the I squared C, it casts a 32-bit unsigned integer to this number. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this as well, just to make sure that I don't have to worry about some debugging issues later on. The I squared C has a control register like most features of the chip. So let's go ahead and see what we need to do in that. And there are two control registers. There's one and number one and number two. The control one register, the control register number one, is more of a register that takes care of initialization, the setting up the the peripheral to do what you need it to do. And the one that we're more interested in is the peripheral enable. And we need to enable this in the first control register. The second control register is the register you're going to be using while you're communicating. And it allows you to do a start, stop, a knack, how many bytes you, do, you, you intend to either receive or transmit, and the slave address bit, or the slave ID. You'll be entering into this. And you'll see that it's, 
kind of interesting to notice that there's nine positions here or ten positions here. So generally we're going to be using a seven bit address which is going to be in this position here and we'll have a write or a read bit at this position. And you'll see in the programming that this is actually done automatically. But we will have to set up the the ID or the address in this location using a left shift operator. So let's go ahead and set up the first control register, which is the peripheral enable. The code so far takes care of setting up and the main initialization of the I squared C. First setting up the, the two pins so they are output for the alternate function and setting up the I squared C for the timing and enabling the peripheral. The next code that we're going to be writing, and that's going to be in the next video, is actual communication, which will be generally from the control register number two, which will entail setting up the ID for the device, starting communication, stopping communication, sending addresses for registers for the ADXL, and either modifying the addresses, the registers, or reading those registers. I hope this helps. Thank you for watching. I've given you a tiny bit of knowledge. Because I'm doing this for peanuts, you can show your support by clicking the like button. Go ahead. You can do it. Click it. Go ahead. And also by subscribing and clicking on the notifications. Oh look, I've made it to 1.1 million. Oh no, that's not me. Oh yeah, and go to my channel where you can find all of the playlists.